goodbye to Miss Rachel Blini for six minutes. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Clark. It's very good to see you again here before the committee. And I, of course, uh, want to thank you for your service in the many ways that you have done that service. And I think that needs to be recognized as well. And, and I think, you know, for me, um, this is really sad. It's really hard that we have to have this discussion. And, and I think it's important that people understand what this means. It's a place of remembrance and constituents, you know, I'm from BC have flown all the way to Ottawa and I've met with them and we've gone to the tomb. They're either veterans or they are the loved ones of people who have served and they've brought mementos and those mementos are received and then they're taken underneath and held there. And people feel such gratefulness that the picture of their loved one, that you know, some memento is there, that it's held. And so I'm just wondering if you could speak uh, to the committee, but also to all Canadians about how important this particular memorial is across this country and how much more than it is what we see above ground, but what's below and held in remembrance. Absolutely. You have to look back at uh, when the government first started the competition to construct this memorial back in 1925. Their vision at that time was to keep alive the spirit of, of heroism, self-sacrifice. They wanted to represent everything that was noble and great, exemplified by those who have sacrificed their lives at that time in the First World War. And people who stop by the memorial now and leave mementos of their loved ones who in fact are one of those 118,000 Canadians who have fallen in the service of the country, it is their connection with their lost loved one, with an individual who no longer has a voice yet are represented by monuments and memorials such as this one. It's very important to establish that connection and keep the connection. So knowing that whatever they leave will not be discarded, but will be retained is personally satisfying to those individuals. And I'm so happy that that continues. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, that was probably one of the most concerning parts for me. I, I read an article about a veteran who had seen that people were parking near the monument mm -hmm. and he went there to take photos of their license plates because he wanted them to be held to account as I think many veterans uh, would feel and sadly was threatened physically threatened with violence. And I, I just thought, what a terrible outcome of this situation. Um, I, so I guess my next question is really about acknowledging the, the trauma that this kind of desecration could could have on, on people who have served our country. You know, today I'm here in Campbell River and we have the wounded warriors that I know that, you, that the Legion supports that are doing a run right now to fundraise, to bring awareness to people about post-traumatic stress disorder, to understand that our veterans, our military, our frontline folks who are on the front lines of, you know, our police, our, our firefighters, our paramedics, like they're out there fighting and they have this. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to the impact, the maybe unintentional, you know, I will assume that some of the veterans that were there who felt that they were protecting that, I want to respect that. But I also want to respect that the impact that we just saw uh, could have had a profound effect on people, especially those who are ser have served and are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. Absolutely. And in fact, we heard from our Legion OSI special section about that very thing, that uh, that memorial stands for all who have all who have served and fallen in their military service. It's not for one particular mission or war. But of late, uh, the war in Afghanistan, we've seen 40,000 Canadian Armed Forces members participate in that particular operation. And our OSI section uh, was contacted by people who were so adversely affected by what they had seen. And it felt like a personal disrespect that had been made to those individuals. And it's, it's just very hard to vocalize the impact that you as an individual who served your country are seeing now the disrespect that are shown by the people that you thought were supporting you. 
when you went overseas. And I know that the special section reached out to those individuals as much as they could. They offered sessions where they could get together to talk about it because discussing and talking helps alleviate the pain, but the pain never goes away. And this act worsens it. Well, I know only have a minute left and I really want to acknowledge how much you've made it clear that the importance of public access cannot be minimized. No. I'm just wondering, would it maybe be appropriate to have protocols that when we know larger protest or in this case, an occupation is coming, that maybe we, we protect the the monuments and there's more than just the tomb of course we've got the Korean War one just down the street the Aboriginal one would that be a good step that we put those protective ones up right away before the people even arrive to sort of set that tone of respect absolutely preparedness is key take a look at previous large-scale uh, uh, occupations or protests 2002 the G8 take uh, take the streets Ottawa protest we would have learned from that policing agencies would have learned apply what you've learned thank you miss miss Blenheim thank you mr. Clark 